Welcome to Hard Questions, where pastors gather together and take on the tough issues of the day, find answers right out of the Bible. I'm your host, Don Black. I'm the moderator of this fine panel. On today's panel are... Dr. William R. Glaze, Bethany Baptist Church in Pittsburgh. The non-doctor Chris Gibbs, pastor of Crossway Church in the Mars area. I'm Dr. Ray Heipel. I'm the pastor of Providence Presbyterian Church in Robinson Township. And I'm Dr. Chris Marshall from New Life Christian Ministries in Saxonburg, PA. Well, you know, it's good that we have all the doctors here because the first question <laughs> <laughs> is right down our alley. Let's go right to it, gentlemen, if we, if we may. I live with a chronic illness, and I know God has the power to heal me, and I'm consistently praying for his healing, but it hasn't come yet. I'm starting to get discouraged. Why hasn't God healed us when we ask? Who wants to take on that hard question? Or at least start taking on that hard question. I'm looking to the left. All right. Well, listen. I, okay, doctors. <laughs> uh, you, you know, uh, one, one of the things that I'll say, you, you know, there, there's a lot of controversy over this. There are those that will say, you know, oh, well, if you don't get healed, that was God's will. And others say, oh, you should always be healed because God's word always says healing. And, and, and I think that there's a lot of discouragement that has come up when somebody who doesn't get healed and they say, oh, it must be me. And I think the enemy loves these kind of doubts and contradictions and conflicts because if he get you discouraged, now you're no longer thinking about healing. You're thinking about how God doesn't love you, God doesn't like you, uh, and how you're going to die. And I think what is so important with this is first and foremost is know the Word of God. See, we don't have to see everything happen the way we want it to see, but if we know it, if we know what it says, and we know that He is still good, He is still God, and He is still in control, then we can say, God, I'm holding on to your promises. Hold on to the promises. Well, you know, I, I see a, a, a lot of people who are in the same situation as the person that, that wrote in. And, you know, I, I think that to me, like the operative term right there is chronic. You know, mm. so it, does that mean that it's going to be with me forever? Yeah. I, I think that, you know, somebody that's going through something that's not chronic, you know, that they might have some hope at the end of it. But it seems like this person has just kind of thrown, thrown hopelessness off. So, you know, I, I would go back to, you know, one thing that Chris said, then I would go to the book of Job. And, and Job said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Mm -hmm. And, and right so, there. you know, I mean, you know, I mean, again, we can get in this big discussion. Does God heal? Does he not heal? But, you know, the, the, through it all, you know, we have to trust God and keep holding on to his hand. Well, obviously, the apostle Paul had a thorn in his flesh and he asked for healing and, and it didn't come. And God had a purpose in that. And, and I mean, that's the one clear example from Scripture where we find somebody who, who was ill, who wanted to be healed, asked three times, and eventually came away with the understanding that God had a purpose in not bringing the healing for that particular reason. And I don't know with this particular viewer, you know, what the situation or, right. or what the, God's purpose in it is. I believe personally that God is a God of healing. And yes. I believe that Amen. all disease is, is not from Him. It, it comes right. from our enemy. Yes. Um, but what I don't believe is that if everybody can have enough faith, they will always be healed because there's at least one scriptural example where that's not the case. And Job would probably be another example. Right. It, it took, he did get healed after a time, right. but he was afflicted for a long time. Mm -hmm. So when we focus on disease and when we focus on the, the fact that, you know, God could or would or might or should, then mm -hmm. we get distracted away from what is God's purpose in this. Yeah. And, and, you know, and focusing on God's ultimate, um, ultimate will, which is for all of us to know his son, Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, and to be with him forever. The pain and suffering of this life is often unexplained yeah. for, from our perspective. Mm -hmm. um, I, I mean, I, my name's Chris, and I always say there's no T at the end of my name, so I don't know all the answers. Um, only the one with the T at the end of his name knew all the answers, yeah. and they crucified him. So he, he had a lot of affliction in his life as well. Mm. Mm -hmm. Right, that's good. What do you say? That's good. Yeah, I mean, I think that when we look at disease, as, as uh, Chris said, as a product of sin, as a product of the fall, God said, in the day you eat of it, you shall die. And everything that we suffer, you know, in a certain sense is, is a kind of death. And, you know, we are all dying right around this table. We're all aging. And there's going to be, even if God heals you, and I do, do believe that we should pray for healing mm -hmm. and that God can and Amen. often does heal pe people. But 
everybody Jesus healed eventually died of something, whether it was congenitive heart failure or whether it was hardening of the arteries or whether it was, you know, something, uh, cancer, they all got sick and they died. And that, you know, unless Christ comes back, there is going to be an illness that takes everybody, whether, again, whatever you want to call it. So, you know, there's a few scriptures, I think, in addition, Paul talks about in 2 Timothy, I left Trophimus in Miletus sick. I left him sick. I wasn't able to heal him or I, God didn't tell me to heal him or whatever. I left him sick and that's where he is. He's sick right now. And, and so, you know, we do see some of that. Uh, Paul talks about Epaphroditus, one point in Philippians, mm -hmm. you know, he's sick to the point of death, but God had mercy, it says. You know, it wasn't that, well, you know, it, it was something that we should expect or something that we should demand. It was God had mercy and I thank God that he did. And, you know, I, I think that's the way to keep in perspective that even if God doesn't heal you, he still loves you. He still has a plan for you. Well, let's, with healing in mind, maybe we can get some clarification by saying, what's the purpose of healing? What is the purpose of healing? Okay, well, to, to look at that, you got to ask the question, why did Jesus come? Why did Jesus come? And, and some will say Jesus came to heal the sick, but that's not why Jesus came. Jesus came to heal the sick inwardly. You know, the, even the idea of Isaiah 53, 5, where it says, you know, we, we quote, and I think sometimes misquote, by his stripes we are healed. I believe it may, you know, it can mean a lot of things, but... He was pierced for transgressions, bruised for iniquity, you know, and by his wounds we are healed. That word healed in the Hebrew is a word that means to be made complete and whole from the inside out. Jesus used physical healing as a, uh, as I, like one guy said, as a dinner bell, used it as a dinner bell to bring people to him. But the yeah. whole purpose was to restore what's going on in here because relationship had been broken with the Father. Well, Purpose of healing, Pastor. What, what, what is, why, why is even healing on the table? Because you could just say you get sick, and ultimately, as Pastor, as Pastor Ray said, we're all going to die from something. Right. So why is even healing a factor? Well, when you look at it in the life of the believer, the end result is that God would be glorified. Mm -hmm. You know, and that, you know, some people, you know, and I'm not saying God forces sickness on them, but, you know, in the end is that, that he might be glorified. And so, you know, I always tell people that there are three G's whenever you get sick. You know, you got to see God in it. You got to see the good in it. And you got to see the goal in it. And, you know, what That's is the good. goal? That's good. You know, the goal is, is that God would be glorified. It's, it's not necessarily that you would be healed but that God would be glorified. Because if I get healed and I say that, well, you know, the doctor, you know, gave me the stuff to heal me or I've been taking some supplements to heal me, you know, God's not getting the glory out of that. So, you know, the, I would say the purpose of healing is to glorify God. That's good. You, you, you made a good transition for me because my mind was thinking about medicines. You know, we're living longer than we've lived as a culture for a long time because of better health, generally speaking, and better medical care. Where's, what's the source of medicines? Where does the knowledge of medicine come from? Well, I, I would say that it comes from God. You know, right. that, uh, you know, God has put everything here that is needed to, to heal us. So, you know, a man has just discovered how to, you know, uh, put it in certain forms that we can take it. Yeah. But, you know, everything here, God has put everything here that we need. I believe that too. Ray, where, where, where's medicine as far as you are concerned? Yeah, I think that when you look historically, when did technology and when did science really explode? Well, it exploded and, and it really advanced in leaps and bounds right out of the Protestant Reformation. That, you know, as the gospel freed people from their spiritual chains, there were a lot of people who went into different fields. And so you have Isaac Newton saying things like, I'm just thinking God's thoughts after him. And as they examined the creation, understanding it was creation, understanding there is a God, that there's yeah. order to it, that it's got to make sense, they'd see a disease and they'd say, well, there's got to be a way to, there's got to be a cause to this and I should be able to find a way to cure it. And it was that sort of enterprise. I mean, Johannes Kepler, all these early pioneering scientists, they were Christians and they believed in the, the God of the universe. Even the later ones like Einstein still believed in a God. Uh, and so it was because of, I think, that perspective, recognizing that there, this has to make sense. The goodness of God, yeah, it allows even unbelieving people to figure things out and to better their lives if they respond to the creation in the way that God made it. All medicine, all knowledge, would you agree with me that the advancement of knowledge is because God inspires that advancement? 
Yes, could I make a little tangent maybe? Sure, sure. James tells us that every good and perfect gift comes from God, yes. right? So medicine can be included in that. What I would also say is our enemy, the devil, yes. can twist every good yes. and perfect gift and use it for another purpose. So medicine isn't always used for good purposes, mm -hmm. but when it's developed properly with the idea of helping and healing, I believe that motivation comes from God. Whenever the motivation is to help and heal, that has to originate with God because the devil would never have a motivation yeah. of helping and healing. Mm -hmm. But we also, we're all aware, you know, that drugs ha have been used in this culture, in every culture, but in our modern culture, drugs is a major issue. Mm -hmm. Medicine, you know, is, is their drugs. Um, and so the devil wants to use it for negative, but um, the people who are I, I liked what you said about the whole, I mean, it's true. What the Protestant Reformation has a great deal of responsibility for a lot of good in the area of, of science, health, medicine, everything. Yeah, we also got to look at God will never allow himself to become irrelevant. So even though God gives us the knowledge, God gives us the, you know, what we have, it was never with the intention of making him irrelevant. You look, Satan has been trying this from the beginning, if you will, of time. Uh, God said, hey, uh, you know what? You depend on me and I'll give you everything that you need. Eat of any tree but this one. And Satan says, wait a minute, did God really say this? Don't you want to know? And I think that medicine can be something that God can use. But if we use it to make God irrelevant, relevant where I spend more time at CVS and I spend on the floor crying out to God, there might be a problem. Yeah. Well, the point that who gets the glory? Mm -hmm. I know a lot of doctors or medical doctors and they tell me that they don't heal anybody. Mm. They don't cure any disease. Wow. They try to find pathways of healing, pathways of, wow. of curing that are God inspired and that God is the great physician. And that's medicine doctors talking, not every doctor. Mm -hmm. Some doctors don't think like that. They think they are the end of all. <laughs> but, but the smart ones know that God's the source of healing. God wants us whole. He wants us healed. And we are all going to be healed. It's just a question of when. When is that going to be? When is the healing? I believe that Jesus paid the price for our healing yeah. and that we have already been achieved that healing. It has to manifest in our bodies. It has to manifest in our culture. It's not just us as our flesh, but our culture needs to be healed. Our nature needs to be healed. We need to be put back in right standing with God and his creative plan for us. Personally, corporately, and as a, as a, as a culture and as a world, and that's coming. That's coming quickly. And, and the Lord is the source of our healing. Great answers, guys. Hard question, but a real life question. Stay tuned. We're going to come back. We're going to tackle the hard question. We'll be right back. Welcome back. We're here on Hard Questions where pastors are talking about the issues of the day, answering hard questions right, right out of the scriptures. You know, the healing question is persistent. Mm. You know, it's persistent. And my heart goes out to people that are sick and have been sick for a long time, like the woman with the issue of blood. I think about her and what happened. We don't have time to really go into a dialogue about that, about that story, but it showed the persistence of a woman who wanted to be touched mm -hmm. and how Jesus healed her kind of unbeknownst to himself because she had the faith to move forward. So healing is part of God's, the yeah. word says it's, it's the children's bread. So we don't want to let go of the fact that God wants us to be whole, whole body, spirit, and mind. Let's go to our second question. Does the Christian life have to consist of daily problems to prove our faith? Well, you know, I, I, I tell the people at the church that I pastor that you're either in a trial, uh, you just gotten out of a trial, or you're getting ready to go into a trial. <laughs> oh, so, I, I mean, you know, uh, that's, that's a fact of life. You know, anybody that says they don't have problems, then, you know, there's something wrong. So, does it have to consist? No, it doesn't have to consist. But is it a reality? Yeah, it is a reality that we want to have problems. Yeah, you know, it's also how you look at it. You know, I think the enemy wants to magnify everything that we're going through when what we need to do is magnify uh, who Jesus is 
in what we're going through. I mean, it says in 2 Corinthians 4.17, Paul says it for this light momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight. I mean, you talk to some people and they're going through the worst thing ever created until the next week or until the next day or until the next phone call. But he says this light momentary affliction. Paul, a guy who was beaten and stoned and imprisoned, he says this light momentary affliction. So I think it's how you look at what it is you're going through versus how you look at the God who's getting you through it. Mm, mm, and the scripture references three T's in English, trials, tests, and temptations. Mm. And temptations we know come from the evil one. Um, tests come from the Lord. Yeah. But trials are the result of living in a fallen world. That's it. I mean, we That's live good. in a sinful That's world good. and we're going to, I mean, we of no fault of our own, other people who are sinning impinge on our lives and we face those trials. So, so daily, probably, like, like you said, if you're not having one today, you'll probably have one tomorrow. Um, certainly you could by deal next with week. somebody who's yeah, having or, one right or, now. Or somebody else is having one. So they're there as a result. In fact, one of the things I just said this past weekend in our church was, you know, when we look around at all the evil, the wickedness, all the, you know, just look at the news, what's going on. And, and People say, well, if God's good, how can this all be happening? Well, it isn't the good God that's making all this happen. It's the result of the sin and the rejection of the good God. So I think it's pretty much a testimony to the reality of the evil one yeah. when we look around and see all the trials that are out there. Right. Mm -hmm. It seems like that puts us almost in a victim's mentality, though, where we're just waiting for the next shoe to fall. Well, yeah, and I don't think that should be the case because, yeah. you know, I think Chris uh, touched on it already. It, it's that when God entrusts us, and I think you can say it that way, when he entrusts us with a trial, with a tribulation, with, with a certain amount of suffering, you know, Jesus said, blessed are those who suffer yeah. for righteousness sake. Mm -hmm. Blessed are you, you know. Do not be surprised when mm -hmm. the fiery trial comes upon mm -hmm. you. You will have tribulation in this world. All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Well, you know, and all of those things really are proving our faith. I mean, if, if, if you became a Christian and you got a million dollars and a new car and a new house and, you know, everybody loved you, then every scoundrel would be a Christian. But if you became a Christian and suddenly you've got people who are, are condemning you for yeah. no reason and you've got people who are, are lying about you even though you didn't do that, uh, suddenly then it's like, wow, your faith is glorifying God because you believe in him even though you're yeah, suffering. Yeah, and you got to realize, see, Satan is the one who likes to come in and twist things. And so you can be going through something and God's wanting to perfect something in you. You got to trust and worship him in the waiting. You know, there was an earlier program, uh, I think on real life or something where the, the, the term, but God was used a lot. And I think, see, even the enemy wants to, well, wants to inf infect that, but, 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 but God, I haven't seen you come through, but God, I'm still facing yeah. this, but God, I'm not healed yet. Yeah. And I think we need to not let the enemy hijack our, but God moments and know that, but God is still able, but God is still good, but God is still on the throne, but God is still working. And when you do that, you You'll start seeing problems and trials through an eternal and godly perspective. Well, in your pastor work as, as a counselor, mm. how many of life's problems are self-afflicted? Just bad decision making has now come home to roost. Mm. And how many are these mm. three T's that you're talking about? Because I come up with another fourth T that, that is our own doing. You know, just what, what percentage of our problems we, do we create for ourselves? Well, you know, I would say a good percentage, you know, and, uh, you know, sometimes I, I use the expression, we have seen the enemy and we as they. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and so when you, when you look at that, you know, we, we do cause a lot of our problems. And as I, as I talk to people, you know, for instance, you know, a guy that, you know, is unfaithful in his marriage mm -hmm. and then, you know, has problems. Well, you know, that, that, that's a problem that you caused. Mm -hmm. And, and so, you know, you run into situations like that. And, and so I, I would say a good deal of people's problems are self-inflicted. And one of our youth pastors always says this to, to the young people. He said, are you going to make a 15-minute decision or a 15-year decision? 15-minute decisions feel good for 15 minutes. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and, and those are the decisions that are self-inflicted. And so many times we do that. But if you really think about a situation, mm -hmm. what's going to happen if I don't do this fit thing that's going to make me feel good for 15 minutes. 15 years down the road, I'm yeah. going to be a healthier, more whole human being following Jesus, and I, I won't be on, that's you good. know, I won't be in the ditch. And Don, do you, you, you wanted your fourth T, so you've got whatever, tests, trials, temptations, trespasses, because see, that is something I take responsibility for. I messed up, and the problem is, is a lot of people don't want to take responsibility. They want it to be blamed on somebody else, and even if something bad has happened to me, and I've shared before that I've had some bad things happen to me, I still have 
have a responsibility on how I get through it with him. I can blame everybody else or I can say, God, you've allowed some things and you're going to use it for my good to see the salvation of many lives. And I am not going to trespass by blaming or neglecting who you are in this. I'm taking responsibility for what I do have. Let's move. Well, even if it's our own doing, mm -hmm. that's not condemnation because we all make mistakes. We all do stupid things, which we wish we didn't do. Mm -hmm. Even in that case, there's a path out of that that gets us out of the mm. trouble mm. that God provides. Absolutely. In fact, you know, Hebrews chapter 12 talks about how the Lord chastens every son whom he loves. And if you're without chastening, you're not a, a, a son. But in the meantime, that verse also says, and chastening is painful. Yeah, none of it feels you know, good. And it doesn't time. feel good when you go through it. And so, you know, to tell somebody, well, um, you know, the, the, the Lord is chastening you. I, I want to tell people at the same time, and you should try to avoid unnecessary chastening in your life if you can. And, and the way of obedience really is the way of blessing. I mean, God, it doesn't, you know, you can't guarantee anything to anybody, but the chances are, I mean, if you love your wife and you're kind to her, you're going to have a better marriage. If you're a decent uh, father to your children and you love them and you discipline them and yet, you know, you do it lovingly, you're going to have, a, you know, a better family life. If you show up at work on time and you work hard, I mean, one thing after another, and, and it's like we've already said, when we don't do those things and then bad things happen to us, well, I think you got to look at your heart first. And then, yeah. you know, if it turns out that, well, you know what? No, I'm, I'm doing the right things. Well, then, you know, God is being glorified in your suffering for righteousness mm -hmm. sake. And in all of those things, Romans 8 says, we're more than conquerors. I love that word in the Greek. It's hooper yeah. nikomen. We get the word Nike, mm -hmm. shoes, Nike, victor. <laughs> we're more hooper, yeah. super victors. Um, so you, you talked about being the victim. We're never the victim if Jesus Christ is in charge of our life. We're always the victor, co-victors with him. Mm. So but, just do it. <laughs> just do it. <laughs> and the sad thing about the, the person who's always don't play in the victim game is there's no way out. Mm -mm. Because it's like, well, you believe in God and you're a child of God and there's nothing he can do because, you know, he's already trying it. And it's like uh, so many people uh, do that and then they become bitter. You become bitter at the Lord when really the problem was you're not really obeying him right in the first place. Well, you know, and we need to become uh, better instead of bitter. That's it. And, you know, uh, I, I have an expression that I've used over the years, and that is God is like if people do me wrong, you know, you know God is going to deal with them. But in my life, God is not so much interested as, as what people are doing to me as to how I respond. Amen. That's, exactly you know, that's the only right. thing you can control that's is right. how that's you respond. That's exactly right. It's how we respond to everything that's important. We're going to take a break. We're going to come back for our rapid fire round. You don't want to miss it. We'll be right back. We like to end our program with a scripture. Let's go to Psalms, which says this, I trust in the mercy of God forever and ever. I will praise you forever because you have done it. And in the presence of your saints, I will wait on your name for it is good. Hallelujah. In the presence of the saints, we will wait. Okay, here we are. Rapid, rapid fire. How do you get out of trouble, Pastor? Well, when Peter was uh, walking on water and he started to sink, he said, Lord, save me. So the first thing we need to do is turn to the Lord. That's it, because you got to acknowledge that you've done wrong, accept the responsibility, and apply the truth. Mm -hmm. Acknowledge the responsibility and apply the truth. Okay. I think you want to look at the situation, and maybe you should be in trouble. <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe the things that are happening to you, because you're, you're doing the right thing. So, you know, look at what's going on around you, and, and scripturally, what are you doing? Is it the right thing? Then ask God for strength to bear through the trouble. If you're doing the right thing, then rejoice in the trouble. Be blessed are the persecuted, or James, blessed are the James righteous. One. Yeah. Consider James pure one. joy, right? Yep. If, if you're doing it for the right, if you're in trouble for the right reason, keep doing it. Yep. If you're in trouble for the wrong away. reason, yeah. turn around. Oh, how, okay. So how do you get out? How do you get out of the wrong trouble? Repent. Turn back. I mean, one I heard a long time ago. How do you get to heaven? Turn right and keep going straight. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's interesting. <laughs> Turn right and keep going straight. Well, I don't know how to close the program any better than that. Here's the, here's the secret. If you're doing something you know is wrong, your spirit will, will convict you. The Holy Spirit will convict you. You'll know it inside yourself. Even if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, He's put your conscience in you. The God sparks in you. You know it. Turn from it. Turn around. We want to hear your hard questions. Email them to us. Hard questions at ctvn.org. Love to hear them. 
love to talk about Jesus. He loves you. Now listen, we are more than victors through Christ who strengthens us.